At the moment, everyone agrees that so-called artificial intelligence is only partial intelligence. But some scientists, proponents of what is known as strong artificial intelligence, believe this process will, one day, go much further and replicate human intelligence fully. This is a materialist view where the brain and everything in it, consciousness, soul and all, is just physical material. And the one you would place above the three, which was the last figure that you used. The way we learn mathematics, it is perhaps not surprising that many have come to believe that minds and computers work in the same way. The apparent link is a mathematical device for problem solving called an algorithm. You bring down the six. Much of elementary mathematics involves the following of step-by-step -step mechanical rules, such as in adding or multiplying numbers together. These operations are instances of what are called algorithms. With 11, you then bring down the 725s, come to 175. And of course Examples of these systematic processes of calculation have been known since the times of the ancient Greeks. But it was not until the 1930s that the concept of a general algorithm was formulated. The man who formulated it launched a revolution that has transformed our world and created the arguments for strong artificial intelligence. Alan Turing was a mathematician of genius who helped break the Nazis' Enigma code at Bletchley Park during the Second World War and committed suicide in 1957 after being persecuted for his homosexuality. He left behind a legacy of work which laid the foundations of the computer age. In this electronic age, computers are rapidly becoming man's best friend. After the war, the idealized concept of the Turing machine inspired scientists to make it into a physical reality in the form of computers. Problems at the speed of light and spew out the answers on punched cards, punched tape, or magnetic tape. All modern computers derive from this. Serial computers, the kind most of us come across, which carry out computations one after the other. Parallel computers whose massive power comes from their ability to run a multitude of computations at the same time. All work algorithmically. While most computers are programmed so-called top-down, where their algorithms are fixed and dedicated to solving specific given tasks, some are programmed so-called bottom-up. Here their algorithms can modify themselves in an algorithmic way so that the computer can, in a sense, learn from experience and can, for example, recognize patterns. Computers like this mimic the neural activity and architecture of the human brain. But essentially, they are still just acting out algorithms. The algorithm is a universal concept which applies to everything which works mechanically. And whatever a Turing machine is made up of, silicon chips or old tin cans, it will always work in an algorithmic, computational way. Even the spongy grey matter of the brain could act as a Turing machine. And for the proponents of strong artificial intelligence, it not only could, it does. And that's all it does. The proponents of strong artificial intelligence argue that human intelligence acts according to algorithmic processes just like computers. When we start out, they say, we are like unprogrammed hardware. As experiences crowd in on us, we learn from them and process them, creating new algorithmic rules and programs as we go. According to this argument, we develop perceptual programs that allow us to read the physical world. We learn, for example, how to predict where an object that has disappeared will reappear. We learn to recognize emotions in others and in ourselves. 
we learn rules that enable us to live as social animals, learn to make sense of the world. Of course, this process does not mean we all end up the same, like a run of mass-produced computers. We are individuals, each with our own personality. The strong AI position argues that this arises because each and every one of us is subjected to so many different and varied experiences that the outcome of the algorithmic process each brain goes through is unique. This algorithmic process is obviously highly complex and sophisticated, so not even the most committed proponent of strong artificial intelligence believes computers are yet anywhere near powerful enough to replicate human intelligence. For them, we may not be there yet. It is just a matter of time, the development of sufficiently powerful computers and of the right algorithms before computers will be able to replicate human intelligence and then race beyond it. And because in their view, thinking is computation, such computers will be conscious. On the face of it, this might seem a persuasive argument. We have all experienced some kind of algorithmic thinking. Whenever we do a long division sum, or follow the instructions as to how to use a calculator to do it, for example. Yet, while there is no doubt that some aspects of thinking are algorithmic and therefore replicable in computers, I shall argue that there are critical aspects of our consciousness which do not fit and cannot ever be fitted into this computational picture. A computer-controlled robot could be programmed to respond to green, to pick out green materials, say, but that would not mean that the robot actually experiences green, as the children do. Instinctively, we feel a computer couldn't actually experience anything at all. For the proponents of strong artificial intelligence, this is an unimpressive argument. There is no difference, they say, between actually experiencing green and behaving exactly as though one is experiencing green. Well, that's a philosophical argument which could go on until the end of time. But there are kinds of human understanding which I believe more unarguably and scientifically demonstrate that they cannot be properly simulated by any computational activity whatever. An example. How do we know that A times B will always equal B times A, where A and B are ordinary numbers? If we substitute actual numbers for A and B in each case, we can work it out. They also give us the same answer here, 6. It is also clear that the computer can work this out as well. But how do we know that this is true for any A and B whatsoever? We don't even have to know that 3 times 2 is 6 to see that 3 times 2 is the same as 2 times 3. We know that we have 6 crosses they could have been sweets, apples, whatever in your problem. But we have six of them in both sets. Are these two groups the same? Are they the same? Look at them. Are they the same? Here. Yes. Yes. We've got the same amount of cross inside, but they've been flipped over. Rather than flip this over... The children can see that it is, and we can understand along with them. To us, it's obvious. Casper. Rotated it. We've rotated it. We've turned it or rotated it round to make this shape. Now imagine the numbers are much larger. We don't have to count them all. But if we know there are A rows and B columns, then we know there will be A times B altogether. We can turn this round in our mind's eye and see that this must be the same as B rows and A columns. No matter how enormously big the numbers A and B, we know intuitively that A times B will always equal B times A. But a computer can only work it with the actual examples. And since there are infinitely many actual numbers, no computer, no matter how powerful, would ever be able to finish the computation which would enable it to prove, merely by calculating, that A times B 
will always equal b times a. Of course, we could program the general rule into the computer, but it would not know independently of our telling it. You could not see as we can that the general rule must be true. Indeed, we could tell it that sometimes a times b is not equal to b times a, and the computer would have no way of telling that that was wrong. Now let's turn to something else in mathematics which computers can't cope with. The general problem of tiling the Euclidean plane. What you may ask is that. Imagine a plane stretching away into infinity. The task is to decide whether it can be covered all the way out to infinity without gaps or overlaps using different kinds of geometric shapes or tiles. If we have just one shape of tile, say this regular hexagon, the answer is obviously yes. And if the shape is this irregular pentagon, the answer again turns out to be yes. But if the shape is this regular pentagon, the answer now is an obvious no. We can also consider combinations of tile shapes. If we allow the use of this four-pointed star, as well as the regular pentagon, then the answer is now yes. Though we do not ever literally cover the infinite plane, when we see enough of the pattern we can become confident that it will cover the plane. You can see this. Could a computer be programmed to answer correctly yes or no to the question of whether a particular tile shape or combination would cover the plane? Being algorithmic in operation, it would have to have a program, rules to follow. What might they be? It's noticeable with the example so far that where the shapes successfully tile the plane, in doing so, they created repeating patterns. This insight could be programmed into the computer. It would know to answer yes if it detected that the pieces could be arranged in a way that produces repeating patterns. But does the answer yes occur only with shapes that create patterns that repeat? Look at this pair of shapes. The answer is yes. The shapes cover the plane, but they do not create a repeating pattern. The computer would be stumped. It could use its brute computing power to keep trying the shapes to see if they could fit and create a repeating pattern. Failing in this, the computer would wrongly answer that the shapes will not tile the plane. We could tell our computer that this particular kind of non-repeating arrangement also gives the answer yes. But that wouldn't solve the general tiling problem. To do that, we would have to keep supplying new insights like this forever. But the machine's meant to be computing this, not relying on our insights. No computer, no matter how powerful, could ever be able to finish a computation which would enable it to solve the general tiling problem with the entire infinite plane. The solution is literally non-computable. What might the strong artificial intelligence people say to all this? Well, they might say, fine, why don't we just build into the computer all the rules that could be perceived by human beings? Then it would do as well as we can and do it a good deal faster and more accurately. And in any event, we humans work by such a set of rules. Rules that we have built up not only by the process of logic, but also through millennia of experience and natural selection. Well, they might say that, but a remarkable theorem formulated 60 years ago by a strange and brilliant logician proves that all the rules that can be perceived by human beings cannot be programmed into a computer.
Gödel's enigmatic and challenging theorem revolutionized the basis of mathematics in ways that are still being explored. One thing it demonstrates is that whatever set of mathematical rules we choose to define the action of a computer, provided we believe those rules are right, then we must also believe, perceiving to be actually true, another rule that is completely inaccessible to the computer. In other words, every formal mathematical system, every system based on algorithms, must, if sound and perceived to be sound, be incomplete and perceived as incomplete. There will always be some propositions it will be unable to prove, but which we can perceive to be true. Algorithms are not the answer to everything. They do not encompass all human insights. There are some areas of mathematics and hence of human understanding that are not susceptible to algorithms and so are inherently non-computable. 